Let's get started here. Uh, so here we are, it's November, uh, first week. Uh, we have PS9, is it? PS9. Originally it said it was due in two weeks, but of course it's due this week. Uh, so there's PS9, and PS9 is, <coughs> on the face of it, pretty straightforward. Um, uh, I know it's possible to make it complicated, but the actual solution that I have in mind is quite simple. So if you find yourself writing uh, a lot of difficult, complicated, hard to understand code, you're, you're going about the wrong way, uh, especially the, the mobile. Uh, you can write the mobile very, very simply. Then there's another assignment that will be due the following week, that's PS10. And then we're almost up against Thanksgiving. And so PS10 will be the last solo assignment you'll do. PS11 will come out right before Thanksgiving. It will be uh, a pair assignment, so you'll work with someone else. And that's the last assignment, so it's a multi-week. Basically, you, you spend the two weeks after Thanksgiving working on it. So it's not too early to figure out uh, who you want to have as your partner. Uh, some advice on getting a partner. Uh, you want someone that is about the same level of, of uh, comprehension and capability as you are. Uh, it's, if you have wildly different um, abilities, it won't be a very satisfactory partnership. Also make sure that who you pick as your partner sort of has compatible expectations on you know, how much effort they want to put into it and also the time they have available. So make sure your schedules are compatible. Um, any questions or problems about anything before we go any further? Yeah? So for these, uh, these like group assignments, how does that work? Like, does you just do the code on one computer or? Okay, so he's asking how a pair, how working in a pair would work. Well, in 2420, take 2420, uh, they do lots of pair programming. And there, by pair programming, they mean two people, one computer. Uh, and that's a good way to work. The idea is that, you know, you talk about it, but one person, when you're programming, one person is on the computer working, and the other person is sort of uh, looking over their shoulder, making suggestions or, uh, you know, helping. And then every now and then, every half hour or so, you just switch roles. That's classical pair programming. And some people like working that way. Uh, I'm, I don't, I'm not saying you have to work that way, but... Uh, to, to make it sort of a pleasant experience, uh, you, you ought to think in terms of finding time where you can get together and work on it as opposed to each of you doing something and hope that your efforts can be combined. Any other questions? <coughs> yes? Like how long will you have to, what is assigned what is doing? Okay, so it will, it will be assigned the week before Thanksgiving. It will come out like the, the probably the Friday before Thanksgiving. Week 12. Week 12. Uh, and so the week of Thanksgiving, which is a short week, we'll talk about it some in lecture, and the lab that week will be devoted to discussing the, uh, the project. Because what you'll get is a starting point, so we'll be discussing the starting point. Uh, the only thing due before Thanksgiving is your choice of partner. So before Thanksgiving, you have to commit to a partner. And then after Thanksgiving, there are two weeks in the semester left. The, there's a set of things you'll have to do, and the first benchmark is by the end of the first week, uh, you and your partner need to meet with the TA and show that you're making progress. We'll define progress by some number of uh, goals met. And then the, the final submission, we do the last day of classes, which is Thursday of the, la of the last week of the semester. And that's, uh, that's when you actually submit the code. So the answer is three weeks. Yeah. That is true. Any other questions? Yeah? How will the grading scale be determined in the end? How will the grading scale be determined in the end? Well, I sort of, my, what I generally do is I rank the class according to their grades and I usually have a class GPA in mind, and I just draw lines, okay, these are the A's, these are the B's, and I adjust them until I hit my desired GPA. 
you know, I, I would never adjust the grades down from, I mean, typically 90 and above is an A, 80, you know, 80 to, 89 to 80 is some sort of B and so on. I wouldn't make it any stricter than that. I often expand it out. Yes? So how does our uh, percentage in Canvas reflect our actual um, percentage that we have that you're going to use? Okay, so the percentage that Canvas displays, I mean, the problem with the Canvas displaying percentage right now is that it's giving more weight to the, it's giving more weight to everything than they'll have in the end because the final exam isn't in there. All right, so when there's a, fi the final exam is like 30% of your grade or something. So w once there is a final exam grade in there, the, the other things become less important. Uh, and it, the problem with Canvas is at no point will it have your correct percentage uh, because of what I'm doing with the challenge exercises and the uh, participation exercises, which is rate multiplying the percentage by 1.2 up to a max of 100. There's no way to get Canvas to do that. So your actual percentage would be slightly higher, unless you have 100% participation in challenge, which almost no one does. Any other questions? Yeah. No, it's, there's, you know, it doesn't act as any form of extra credit. What it boils down to, if you get about 84% on either one of those, that's will turn into 100%, but you won't go above that. Yeah? So for this project, we're not allowed to Well, for, yeah, for the mobile part of the project, it says not to modify the class except to implement the methods. There's really no need for adding instance variables will just make it harder, more complex. If you're, yeah, that's, it really isn't going to help. Okay. So I was talking to a colleague of mine in the hall the other day, and she said, that she hated this time of year, and I said, why? And she said, because the work keeps piling up and there's no end in sight. And so I was repeating that on the phone to someone that had called me, and there was a student in my office, and as I was saying that on the phone, he was nodding his head. So it seems to be a fairly common, commonly held belief. And I can tell by looking at you all that a lot of you are kind of feeling the stress. So let me ask you, how, how could I lower the stress level? What? Yeah. Make Zybooks optional. Make Zybooks optional? <laughs> <laughs> it seems to be a little, yeah. Yeah, but the thing about the Zybooks is I really want people to do the participation activities before lecture. The point is to try to get you to think about what the lecture is going to be about. But, okay, I understand the, the whole thing about Zybooks. I realized I made a mistake. What I was doing all semester was just publishing, putting the uh, Zybook assignments on my schedule, which I look at all the time, but I don't think you folks look at it very often at all. Uh, lately, I've been making it an assignment, so it shows up somewhere and reminds you. So I think, I think that was a mistake I would change next time. Yeah. What about on the final project, team for three instead of two? Three heads better than two. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. Our experience is that uh, teams of two would work best for for our learning our learning uh, objectives. Yeah. Make the problem test do Friday every week. Uh, okay, so I'll tell you, I'm I'm not opposed to that. My problem is, I'm worried about staffing levels in the Cade Lab on Friday. How was it this past Friday? It's kind of slow. It was kind of slow. I mean, it was consistent all day, but there wasn't, you know, 30, 40 people in the queue like Thursday. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll make the assignments. I'll make the uh, next two assignments due on Friday. So that's easy enough. Um, I am, by the way, you know, I, I gave you a way of earning, of making up some of your lost participation and challenge points. But I did that without looking at what I was doing. Mainly, I said you could, you could earn them on the, by doing challenge activities on the chapters I didn't assign. But then I went and looked, and there are not many challenge activities in those chapters. Yeah? I think you need to point out that there's not going to be a lot of help on Fridays. 
Right, so yeah, that's, that's sort of what I mentioned about the assignment. Still, you, if you want help, they'll be more available on Thursday. So, so my way of making up points isn't going to work out very well. So I'm I'm trying to think of something else I could do to help you. Yeah. Um, I think specifically in regards to the partner project, uh, just for those of us that don't really know anyone else in the class, mm -hmm. maybe making one of the labs like a collaborative pair up kind of thing so you can meet people. We yeah. do that in class here. Well, yeah. So we, we will in class. I'll give you an opportunity to meet meet people that need partners. But I think the, the idea of having working in pairs in labs is good. And in fact, the last lab, which got canceled, um, that had been my intention. Um, so let's just do that for the rest of the semester. Try to pair up in labs. Yeah. Drop the lowest assignment score. Drop the lowest assignment score. You know, I'm just taking information right now. I'll, <laughs> You know, I read an article about how President Trump deals with tough questions. You know how he does it? What he says? Same thing my mother used to say. He says, we'll see. <laughs> so, we'll see about that. Yep. Uh, maybe, if we, uh, maybe some extra credit assignments so we can get some points. Okay, extra credit assignments he mentioned. And um, there will certainly be extra credit available on the final project. So I can definitely commit to that. Yep. You're saying if I don't allow dropping the lowest score, let you go back and fix it. Okay. Look, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we will grade for our peers, but what if I have I have I have a peer who didn't do anything and I have to do everything? You talking about a partnership and your? Yeah, the final project. Okay. Well, that's why I'm saying don't. You know, <laughs> ideally, you don't pick a partner okay. that isn't gonna. Pull their weight. Can I comment on that? Yeah, Stephen can comment. <clears throat> Part of the assignment is to turn in, uh, there's small five point assignments where you turn in and you give your opinion on the assignment. And you say how much you've done on the assignment, how much your partner's done, and if it's been 50 50. So you can comment on your, I don't want to say rat on, <laughs> but you can comment on your, on your partner at that time. So. Since you know you're doing it, you can. You also know your partner is going to be commenting on you, so that will influence your partner to help. Hopefully, I mean, historically we don't have many problems, but we always have some problems. There are always <clears throat> several partnerships that just implode for whatever reason. We just try to find some way to be fair about it. Put some thought into picking your partners. Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Homework. Class. Oh. Okay, so Stefan sent out an announcement. So we've been trying this for two weeks, and it, for various reasons, it hasn't gotten off the ground yet. But tomorrow, barring a snowstorm, there will definitely be a homework review session at 3 o'clock in Web 3147. M. Meb. Meb. Oh, gosh. M-E-B, building my office is in, uh, not the classroom building. M-E-B 3147, just down the hall from my office. Stefan will do that. He'll be there from 3 to 5. You can come, come when you want, leave when you want. Uh, rear, go to a different lab section if you have to. He'll go over PS8, was it? Probably 6, 7, and 8 this time, and probably yeah. give some hints on 9 if you want. Yeah. So he'll, that's just another way to learn some more. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to think what's next. <coughs> All right, last time I was sort of rushing at the end trying to get through uh, this problem of writing recursive methods to consume the file system. And I... Um, I sort of thumbed it along because I was getting a return value I didn't expect, even though it happens every semester when I teach this. Uh, it seems like every time I do it, it catches me by surprise. So I wanted to do this last one here. We didn't do at least last time. Uh, and you're doing three more that are like the three in this, that were in the lecture. So I just wanted to do this uh, so we could calmly look at how it works instead of uh, leaving it like it was at the, end of at the end of class last time. So just to remind you, we've got, uh, the idea is that we've got, we take as a parameter here a, uh, what I call FD, 
either a file or a directory. So it, it says file there, but capital F-I-L-E is just something in the file system. It could be what you think of as a folder, which Java calls a directory, or it could be you know, what Windows calls a document, but this thing calls a file with a little f. And we're just, the idea is you get some piece of the file system, it may be a single file, it may be a big part of the directory tree, and you're supposed to find out, in this case, is there a file or directory whose size is at least that big, at least bytes big. But somehow you've got to systematically look at every, um, everything in the tree until you find something that's big enough, and then you return true. If you don't find something big enough, you return false. So what I encourage you to do is to start with a problem that's similar. Now, this one here, count, we ended up writing an accumulation loop within which we were making a recursive call. This one, we wrote an optimization loop within which we were making a recursive call. The recursive call being right here. This one, I designed to be a searching loop within which we make a recursive call. So I don't have an exact example to copy, but I'll copy, uh, I'll copy the accumulation loop. And then we'll figure out how to change it to make it do the right thing. So the structure here, where it says, if you're dealing with a file, <coughs> else you're dealing with a, a directory, it's going to be the same. You're going to see the same NFL structure in all the methods you can write. And what's going to be different is, what do you do when you've got a file? And what do you do when you don't have a file? So let's start with the base case. It's always the easiest. The base case is non-recursive. And if you've got a single folder, it's not a folder, you've got a single document, a lowercase file, and you've got to report whether or not it is at least bytes big, what do you return? In, in the base case, there will no, be no recursion because there's nothing contained. There are no other files or folders contained inside of a base, a base file. Yeah? We find the size compared to bytes and return true or false. Right. So we just got to compare the actual size of the file, which is fd dot length. And compare it to bytes. So that's all it takes. Return, I mean, this is either going to be true or false. If the length of the, of the file is at least bytes, it'll return true. If it's not, it'll return false. Okay? So you don't have to have an if then else here. You just compute true or false and return it. Okay? Any questions about that? Yeah? Length is, yeah. Length is just a method on all file objects. Yeah? How long was a byte again? Was it 8 bits? The byte is 8 bits. <clears throat> Thanks. Mm -hmm. Or another way to think about it is a byte is the number of bits it takes to, re to represent a character. So if you have 1,000 bytes, that's about 1,000 characters, depending on the encoding. But yeah? Um, where is total being initialized? Is it outside? Oh, to I, he asked where total is being initialized. I, I already <coughs> deleted it because we don't need it because it's a, uh, we were, I copied this from the accumulation a different method. So we're going to have to change the, the, um, the else part. Okay? So now we've got to look at every, you know, if, we don't, if we're not looking at a single file like we are here, we're looking at a directory, at a folder. And so we've got to look at the folder itself and everything it contains, no matter how far down they are. And you could have a folder containing a folder, 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 and finally there's a big file. So we've got to look at everything. But if you start thinking about that, you start thinking about all the possible ways the folder can be configured, you know, it, there's an infinite number of ways it could be configured. What you've got to just, uh, to, to what you got to focus in on is that the folder contains some things that are either files or folders. And don't, don't look below that level. So we have this bit here, if files is not equal to null, because I found when I was searching my file system, sometimes this returns null. So if it returns null, I'm just sort of uh, uh, 
not looking any further. But typically, this will not return null. And so we come down here. So what's this loop going to, forget what's in here, what's that loop going to need to do? <clears throat> yeah? Check and see if it's larger than the number of bytes. Okay, so he said check and see, so that for every F that's in the folder, he said check and see if it's longer than bytes, and if so, return true. Can you fix the note so they can be read? Fix what? No. The Java dog. <clears throat> Is that right or wrong? Yeah. Okay, if it only contained files, i.e. documents, that'd be exactly what we'd want to do. But it may be that the folder contains other folders. We don't, we don't just look at the folders link, we've got to look at the things it contains. Call it, call it so we've got, to, we've got to recursively find out whether uh, any of the things contained in the folder contain something that's at least that big. So how do we find out? So we've got this F right here. How do we find out whether it contain whether it is or whether it contains something that's big enough? Yeah. Can we just feed it back into itself? Call at least and put the input as F and then bytes again for the one. Exactly. We just say if at least F comma bytes. That'll tell us whether uh, F or anything underneath it in the file system has at least that many bytes. What do we do if F or something underneath it contains the right number of bytes? Return true. We return true. We found what we're looking for. And what if this loop ends and we haven't found what we're looking for? False. False. Now there's one small problem with it at this point, but let's focus on what's right. It's a classical searching loop, isn't it? You, you know, ignore this little if right here. That's it's just there for technical reasons. This is a classical searching loop. You're searching for, for everything in some collection. You are seeing if it has some property, and if it does, you return true. Classical searching. <coughs> and if the loop ends, you haven't found what you're looking for, you return false. Okay. So let's see what questions there are about this, or you can even tell me what's wrong with it. Yes? Um, so when you have if at least f comma bytes, mm -hmm. um, why isn't it, oh, so when that is, uh, when those parameters are re-entered through, and then it says at the top, if f e dot is filed, mm -hmm. does it matter that they're named differently? Like, So he's concerned, I think, that when at least calls at least, I mean, at least could call at least, which you call at least, and so on. You know, if the folders go 10 deep, we're going to get at least calling at least down 10 levels. Is it a problem that they each have a variable called FD? No. no. And it's, it's not. It's just the dummy variable. It's, you know, the, the, the variable is not accessible outside the method. If it makes you feel better, you can just think, the way, effectively, you can think of the, the at least, imagine making 10 copies of this method and calling it at least one through at least 10. And then at least one will call at least two, and at least two will call at least three. It would work the same way as this would. So when you call at least with add comma bytes, and mm -hmm. then it is calling at least, um, when it says if fd dot is file, is fd representing f? Or? Yeah, fd path represents, you know, when you call at least of f and bytes, fd will be, re will be representing f. But the thing to realize is, when you call a method, it has some memory. I call it a stack frame, where it stores the values of its variables. If you call it recursively, it gets a new stack frame for that call, and a new stack frame for the next call, so they don't interfere with each other. Yeah? Uh, I was wondering, do we need our innermost if statement, I mean, which I mean, if true, return true, wouldn't it be able to possibly simplify the code by just saying return at least? Okay, so what would be the problem if we just said return at least f comma bytes instead of having an if? Yeah. If it was false, then it would return false before checking everything. Right. So if the folder contains 10 things, say the folder contains 10 other folders, and it's only the last folder that somewhere in it contains the big file. 
the first folder we look at won't contain a big file and we'll just return false as our answer without having looked at the other nine. So in this case, we can't do the shortcut. Yeah? Is there a problem with not building the files? Problem with what? Not building the files after Not loading the files. I, I either got Is there a problem closer. not closing the files? Oh, not closing. Well, okay, we're not opening any files. So, yeah, when you create a file, you got a file, you got information about it, but you're not opening it. We never read anything from the files. We're just looking at attributes. What's the problem? Can't see the code. Okay. That's a problem. <laughs> yeah? Java docs, it says reports whether directory ID contains contains what? Oh, either directly or indirectly. Oh, okay, sorry. That doesn't is it that doesn't have any message telling us? No, it's not that. It's suppose that all you've got, suppose FD is an empty folder. Well, a folder has a length. <laughs> and uh, Suppose bytes is like 100, and the empty folder that we pass it has a length of 1,000. Shouldn't we return true? We should. This won't return true because it never looks at FD itself. It only looks at what FD contains. It does not look at the size of FD itself. So what should return here is what? We just do that again. So if we didn't find anything inside the folder that's big enough, it may be that the folder itself, by itself, is big enough. Okay? When I talk about the size of the folder, it, that doesn't, it's not like the size of the folder is the size of everything it contains. Uh, a folder is usually you know, 1,000 or 2,000 bytes or something. It's just the, the size of the data structure it takes to keep track of what it contains. Okay? Now, that's a little bit suboptimal. What's the way we could improve the performance in certain cases? Yeah? Do you initi uh, initialize a Boolean variable that uh, is fd.length? Yes. Well, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, having a, a, a local variable be, might, wouldn't be a very big deal, though. Yeah? Um, we first, well, we just, um, if fd.length is, um, fd.length is real and equal to bytes, we can just return that out of, we can just return true. And if not, then we can check it with the file or folder. Right. The idea would be to uh, do the check up here first. That way we could avoid possibly executing that loop at all. So it's a little bit better to do that first. So because if it's big enough, that saves us all the looking. doesn't change the answer. It just speed it up a little bit sometimes. Now I'm going to try an experiment here. I'm going to hit a breakpoint right there. And then up here, let's see what we're going to do. We're going to do Unfortunately, I think that number is wrong right there. I think this is going to return false, but let's run it and see. Uh, the problem is I, I thought I decided that file was too big and I went and substituted in okay all right never mind I don't I'm not sure sure what file system is looking at at this point but uh, let me see if there are any any last questions I could answer about this thing that's just an example of a searching loop that just ha happens to have a recursive call inside it instead of some other method call. You'd be writing three loops just like these here. An optimization, an uh, accumulation, and a searching loop. Yeah? So that first if statement inside the else, is that just, is that checking like, uh, what is that checking? That's checking the folder itself. So,
So the idea is you've got, let's say, some folder, and it contains a file, and another folder, and another folder, and another folder, and a file. So what that code is doing is, first, it checks to see whether this folder right here is big enough. Do the folder has a size. If it's big enough, we'll just return true right away. Otherwise, we recursively find out whether this thing, this, this piece of the file system right here, which is just a single file, contains something that's big enough. Whether this here, which who knows how big that is, contains something somewhere that's big enough. So we just go and look at each of these different things. And if any of these contains something big enough, we end up returning true. So if the big file is down here, that's the only one that's big enough, we'll eventually find it and return true. Yeah? So, uh, I guess I don't understand how directories work. So, if you have a file in a folder and then but it has other um, orders in it, mm -hmm. the size of that folder is not the sum of all the folders. No, that's what I was saying. The size of a folder, I mean, think of these lines here as being addresses in memory. So, a folder just contains the addresses in memory of these five things. I should point this way. The, the top folder contains just the addresses in memory <coughs> and some other things. But yeah, folder can be far smaller than the files it contains. Yeah. So if a folder, so like two, if two there are two folders and they contain the same amount of items, but one has items that are significantly larger, the folders are still the same size. Yes. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Uh, my experience, most folders are about one k big. Yeah. Is there any way to, once it's found true and or one file is, um, it meets the criteria and will return true, is there a way to break all the other levels of uh, recursion and just return true straight to the method? Okay, so what's going to happen is we're going to say, uh, you know, we're going to call the method. It'll call it, you know, it'll make a recursive call, it'll make a recursive call, it'll make a recursive call, make a recursive call. And let's say this one decides to return true because uh, it, it hits a base case where the file is big enough. So what he's asking is, what will happen is this will return true to that method, which will then return true to that one, which will return true to that one. I've got to remember, you can't see what I'm doing unless I draw something. <laughs> this, it returns true to that method, this one returns true to that method, this one returns true, that returns true, and this one finally returns true to whoever called it. No, there's no shortcut. The, the control has to, it's, uh, has to unwind the stack. That true has to propagate back, has to be returned in the opposite order with which with the call with which with the calls were made in the first place. Yeah? Uh, so you said that the first you had in your method, uh, doesn't that serve the same purpose as the if statement within the house? Say again. Does the first if statement um, in your method, does it that serve the same purpose as the one that the first one inside the house? Okay, let's look. Okay, does this serve the same purpose as the, the first day? Yeah. Okay, there's that, and, and then there's this. Do they serve the same purpose? In other words, is the one that's highlighted redundant? No. <laughs> okay, so answer your own question. Why is it not redundant? Uh, they're checking different things. Right, this is checking the size of a this here is checking the size of a little f file. This one here is checking the size of a folder. Now, we could, have, we could have organized the code differently and done the check only once, but I wanted to preserve the structure, which is common to all the other screens. Yeah? So when it checks the size of a directory, uh, like a folder, uh, that check this, does that include all the files that are in that folder? No. no. Remember, the folder basically a folder contains the address of everything it contains. It doesn't, it, it's not like it. Uh, that's like asking, does the index, does the table of contents of a book, is that not bigger than the book itself? Right? No. The table of contents is usually much smaller than the book. Because it doesn't contain the chapters, it contains the address of the chapters. Okay. Yeah? In, in the file class, is a directory what you're referring to as a folder? Directory and folder are synonyms. Directory comes from the Unix world. Folder windows introduced to be contrary. 
Same reason they do backslashes instead of forward slashes. Okay. Well, that's what I call structural recursion because the recursion is uh, the, the, the data is recursively structured. The folders contain other folders. And so that re that's reflected in the code. Here's an example of what I call ad hoc recursion, which is where there's really not data structure involved. So factorial, in factorial, is the product of the first in integers. So so in factorial is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 times 7. And we just define 0 factorial to be 1. And here's a recursive definition of factorial, sort of a classic definition. It's saying if n is 0, the answer is 1. Otherwise, the answer is n times the factorial of n minus 1. Done. So why does that work? Why does it work that n factorial, you can obtain n factorial by just multiplying n by the factorial of n minus 1? Yeah. Okay, so let me expand on what he said. It looks like we're doing it with only one multiplication. All right? Normally, you, you think about writing a loop to multiply all those numbers together. How can we get by with just doing one multiplication? Yeah? Well, technically not doing just one, because when, whenever you call something that's not zero, it's going to call factorial again, and you're going to be doing the same multiplication. Right. So if we pass 7 to here with this factorial method, it'll call factorial of 6. Factorial of 6 will do a multiplication after calling factorial of 5. So they're happening. They're just not, it's just not as obvious here. Yeah? It's the equivalent of having that code repeated uh, until n is equal to 0. Right. So in terms of how many method calls are made, fact of 7 calls 6, which calls 5, which calls 4, which calls 3, which calls 2, all the way down to 0. And then as the methods return, they do the multiplications on the way out. Or another way to look at it is n factorial, I told you, is equal to n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times 1. But we can regroup that as n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 but what is this thing in parentheses here? It's just n minus 1 factorial, right? It's the product of the first n minus 1 integers. So that's just equal to n times n minus 1 factorial. So that's where the recursive definition comes from. You can define factorial in terms of factorial of a lesser number. So it becomes a natural recursion. Now, it turns out it's... Uh, Simpler, it, it's, it, it, it's more efficient if you implement it as a loop. But uh, this is an example that's also sh often shown about power recursion. Yeah? So, what do you, I don't understand how, like, when you have something like 7 or something that's greater than um, 0, like, what exact, like, what code is running to give you that? Well, let's say n is 7. So down here, we're going to multiply 7 by the result of this call. Well, what's, the, what's going to be returned by factorial of 6? Yeah? Uh, you, ch you changed the... I didn't, but the pin did. Um, yeah. uh, then it would uh, be <coughs> 6 times 5 factorial. Okay, well, 6 factorial is 120, I think. Let's say it's 120. So that method call will return 120. We'll multiply that by 7 and return that. And that's, I forget what the original question was. But. Wait, how does that return 120 though? Like where is, where is well, it? right here. Let's look. It says, returns n factorial. Okay, so if n is n minus 1, then this call is going to return n minus 1 factorial. 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6, I think it's 120. I may be off. I, I know, but I feel like, where does it do that? Like, I don't, I still don't know. Well, 
we can set a breakpoint here. This will work. So I'm going to add a breakpoint right there, and we'll compute factorial of 7. I'll hit debug. It hits the breakpoint, and let's see what's happening. So right here, this was uh, the main method is sitting on this line right here, line 13, waiting to get an answer back. It called factorial of 7. There's the stack frame for it. Up here says n equals 7. It called factorial of 6, and there's n equals 6. It called factorial of 5, and there's n equals 5. So basically, the met there are these methods. You know, factorial has been called now eight times for 7 through 0. And, uh, and now this thing's about to return 1. So we return 1. I'll step out. And now we're about, we, got, we got 1 back as our answer, and we're going to multiply it by 1. So I'll step out, and uh, I got 2, and about to multiply that by, I got 1, I'm about to multiply that by 2. I'll step out, I got back a 3, and I'm going to multiply that by 2. We return 6, then we return 24, then we return my 120, and, oh, that's 5 factorial. Okay. Then uh, 6 factorial is 6 times that, which is 720. And then we're back to the top level called a factorial, which is going to return 7 times 720, which is 5,040. So, I mean, that's what's going on. There's a lot of memory being used to keep track of all the different values of n. But the multiplications happen. I, uh, you know, I put the, the lab that we missed last week is online. You can do it anytime you want. You can basically give yourself credit for doing it. But it has some exercises. It's a lot better, I think, when you're actually doing this yourself, setting breakpoints and experimenting, and you're watching me do it. So I encourage you to do that. Okay. Um, let's take a break and we'll look at something new. Okay. Um, we're going to move along to a new topic now, and the topic is actually graphical user interfaces. Um, but one motive I have for introducing graphical user interfaces is it will require us. Uh, to see examples of polymorphism. Polymorphism will be our big topic after this week for the rest of the semester. Uh, so we can think of this as not only an uh, introduction to how to write graphical user interfaces, but also an introduction to polymorphism. So polymorphism, the word, you know, is, it has some roots in it. There's poly, which means many. Think polygon, many sides. Morph, which means shape or form. And ism, which can mean the practice of. So what polymorphism is, is the practice of creating program components that can take many forms. Sort of, if, if you take that, the word literally. So the, the, you know, that, that's where the, the word comes from. And what I'm going to show you here are uh, three examples of, of uh, how you achieve polymorphism in Java. And those three ways are generics, interfaces, and inheritance. Um, and we'll uh, see what they are here. So this is going to be a very high-level view of these topics. And like I said, in coming weeks, we'll talk about them in more depth. Um, so the first example of polymorphism are generic classes. And that's something you're familiar with. Uh, array lists are generic classes. Tree lists, hash maps, tree sets. Not tree list is one. Link list. Uh, uh, sort of uh, hash set, tree set, that sort of thing are generic classes. And the idea is, if Java did not have generic classes, then we'd end up having to create a string array list if we wanted an array list to contain strings, and an integer array list if we wanted something to contain integers, and a big rat array list, and so on. So every time we wanted to create a new kind of list for a new kind of type, we would have to create a new class that's just like the old one, but holds strings instead of integers. Uh, as you can imagine, the code for an array list, doesn't much care what kind of thing is stored in it. That's a, that's a very minor difference. And so all these classes that I'm postulating on the left here would be 
pretty much the same. So what Java provides are generic uh, classes. And so uh, array list being a generic class, you can say, OK, I want an array list where the element type is string. Or I want an array list where the element type is integer. Or I want an array list where the integer type is big red. Um, so go back to the word polymorphism. What's taking many forms here? So how does that fit our definition of it? We got a thing that can take many forms. Yeah? The array list is taking different forms. Right. The array list is a single thing, and yet it can take different forms as we need it. So rather than having to write a new array list class every time we have a new type of data, we just have one array list class for all time. And any time you come with a new type of data, you can stick it in an array list, courtesy of this generic. Now, oddly enough, uh, we're not really not going to talk about creating generic definitions in this class. That's something that's like 2420. We're more interested in using them here. But this is our first look at an example of polymorphism. The idea being you write a, um, a piece of code that can take, be used in many places in different forms. So let me see if there are any questions I can answer about that first example. Yeah? So then, is it correct to say that all the different, like, so the um, an array list of strings is like a is like an extension of the like generic array list? He's, so he's asking, is it like an array list of strings is an extension of a generic array list? Uh, yeah, I, it depends what you mean by the word extension, but yeah, that's not a bad way to think about it. Okay, so there's one example. And wrapper classes, uh, I think last time I used these slides, I hadn't talked about wrapper classes yet. So we, we understand about wrapper classes and what they have to do with generics. OK, then we have interfaces. And that's something kind of new. Um, so an interface is like a class, sort of. It appears in the same places in the program that a class appears. But an interface has no constructors. It has no instance variables. And it doesn't even have any method implementations. It only has declarations. So here's an example of an interface. So the, uh, you know, instead of saying public class C, I'm saying public interface I. So I is just the name of the, name of the interface. And it contains a single method declaration, action performed. Now we'll see what interfaces are good for. Right now they look pretty useless, don't they? Because since there are no constructors, you can't do that. You can't say, create me a new object of type I. So uh, if, if that was as far as it went, they'd be completely useless. So let's see what they're for. So right now, just think of an interface as being a list of method, method headers with no body, no implementation. Now, what a class can do, when you create a class like C up here, you can advertise in the classes header that it implements an interface. In fact, it can implement many interfaces. So when I say public class C implements I, what I'm saying to the compiler and to anyone that wants to use this class is C contains all the methods declared in the interface I. So what would you expect to find inside public class? What method would you expect to find implemented inside, inside of C? Yeah? Constructor? Well, there's a constructor, but what would you what would you expect there to be because it implements I? What are we what are we uh, agreeing to do when we say we're implementing I? All of the methods are in that class. All the methods that are declared in I. Yeah. Well, what methods are declared in I? Yeah. There's only the back one. Okay. Here we are. I declares a method called action perform. So if we are If we're claiming to implement interface I, uh, the compiler's going to complain unless we actually implement a method in here called action perform. Right? So if you see that up the top in the class, it's just saying whatever methods are declared in that interface, I am providing. It's just, uh, that's the deal. You can't claim to be, implement an interface unless that's the case. And then here's the cool thing. When you implement an interface, you can create an object of type C, and you can use it anywhere an object of type I is expected. So you can write methods. Right? Here's a method. 
public void method that expects an object of type i as a parameter. And when it gets that thing, it calls the action perform method on the object. You can create a new C object and pass it to that method. So really, objects of type C now have two types. They have the type C because they were created with a C constructor. But they also are of type I because they came from a class that implements I. So where's the logic here? Why is it OK to pass an object to type C to, to that method up there? Yeah? Because it has all the same uh, methods? Okay, yeah, but what he says is because it has all the same methods. That method, all, the, all that method can do with X is, is call methods from the interface on the object. And we're guaranteed that any object of type C will have those methods defined. So it's safe to pass an object of type C to that method. Because it provides all the methods required by the interface. Yeah. So can C have instance variables? Sure. C can have instance variables. Um, can it have methods that aren't defined in I? It I can have I? methods that aren't defined in I. It can have constructors. What, all it has to have is it has to define all the methods that I mm. lists. Yeah? Can you override um, methods in C that were defined in I? Well, he asked, can you override methods that were defined? The ones that are defined in I are just declared. They're not implemented in the first place. So yes, you have to, in a sense, you have to override them. That's the deal. You have to give implementations for all those unimplemented methods. Yeah? So if you pass in C, can you attempt to call a method that might or might not be in it? But, and so like, no. Okay. All you can do in that method up there, the method, method, uh, all you can do to X is whatever you can do to methods, to objects of type I. And the only thing you can do is call action perform on it. Because there may be a class D that implements the interface and a class X that implements the interface. All those objects could be passed in. And that method is just going to treat them all, all it knows is that they have this action perform method. Yeah? Can you implement multiple interfaces on the same class? Yes, you can have, uh, you know, we could define uh, C there to implement multiple interfaces. Just put a comma. You say implements I, comma, J, comma, K, whatever. Yeah? So an example of the interfaces would be like C4 display on the last assignment. Well, C4 display isn't defined as an interface. It's defined as a class. But we'll see an example here in the GUI in a minute. Yeah? And so that method that's OK in the type I, but we pass it in that uh, variable X, which is class C, could we still, inside of that method that took it in, call uh, x dot something that's defined for a class C? OK, so what he's asking is, OK, we, we're actually passing in a C object to the method. Could that method, in addition to calling x dot performed, action perform, could it call a C method? Say C contains a method f. Could we call f on that object x? OK? The, strict, the, the answer I want you to think about, which actually isn't quite accurate, is no. Because all it knows, all the method knows about the object is that it implements the interface. It, it doesn't have any way of knowing what other methods might work on it. There's a, there's a catch, though. It can try to, you can do casts. You can say, maybe this is an object of type C, and that the method code could try to cast uh, transform X into an object of type C and then call it. But I don't want to get into that detail today. So for now, let's just say no. Yeah. Okay, so it just takes it in and essentially cuts out the rest of C and only takes in the I parts. So, yeah, so what he's saying is, you can imagine it, when, when the object goes into that method, it basically cuts out all the stuff that has nothing to do with the interface. All the method C's are the methods defined in the interface I. Now, and like I say, we'll come back and look at this in a lot more detail. I'm just describing this right now so that when we see it in action in a GUI, I'll be able to say this is an example of an interface. We'll, we'll, uh, don't worry if you're not catching on exactly right here. We'll, uh, we'll loop back and see it. Then there's inheritance. So a class A can say, I am extending class B. So in that case, if class A extends some other class B, B inherits all the non-private methods from, from B. Plus, it can add some more of its own. Plus, it can override the ones it inherited. 
So when you say A extends B, you're saying A is just like a B, except here are the differences. And so the, method, the body of the class will contain what's different between it and, and B. And just as when, back here, when C implements I, we say that uh, C is a subtype of I. C can be used anywhere and I can be used. Here, A is a subtype of B. A can be used anywhere or B can be used. Okay? So in the old days, what would happen is you'd have a class, something like a class, and you'd like it. And you'd say, you know, I would like a new class that's just like that, except it has this additional method. The only alternative was to take the existing class, copy it completely, all the code, give it a new name, and add a method to it. Now, what's the problem? Why does that sound like a bad idea? Every time you want to change a class a little bit, you've got to copy it. You have to rename everything. Well, it's not that you have to rename everything. Yeah? It's hard to see what the differences are. It, right. It's not obvious what the differences are. It becomes a maintenance problem. Suppose you've copied that original class ten times and made different t changes to it, and then you discover a bug in the original class. You've got to track down all the code you copied and fixed it. Okay, with inheritance, you don't do that. You just say, okay, here's a new class. It's just like the old class, but it has this one extra method. And all that goes into the class is the new method. Yeah? So if, uh, when you modify the class that, um, so in this case, if you modify class B, then does class A also take? Sure. Then if, if after you've done this, you go back and change class B, A inherits the changes. Sure. Yeah? Can you extend and implement at the same time? A class, okay, so the deal is a class can only extend one other class. Okay but it can implement any number of interfaces. The other deal is that every class that you write extends a class. So by default, a class extends the class object. Now, you may have looked at the, ob the classes you have written and looked at the methods available in the object. What have you noticed? Yeah? There's, you, there's always a get class method. There's a get class method. There's an equals method. Yeah. There's a hash code method. There are a handful of other methods. Why are those methods in your classes when you didn't put them there in the first place? It inherited them from the object class. There's an object class that's predefined that has those methods in it. You've inherited those methods. So you've been using inheritance all along without really realizing it. Yeah? So when it, say, when it says extends B, does that mean A is inheriting all of what B has? Yes. Okay. Right. A, is, A is taking all that B has, everything that's not private. And, uh, and then adding stuff to it. And so in, an object of type A can be used anywhere an object type B is required. Yep? Um, I'm just reading the first line. Class A can inherit from B. And it seems to conflict with the idea that B inherits the non-private stuff. No, 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 that's A inherits the non-private stuff from B. Okay. Yeah? So, um, Public class A extends B only here for inheritance, a class from another class, and uh, a class from a type is not inheritance, isn't that? Right, so, right, there's two ways to achieve, to achieve subclassing. You can ex a class can extend another class, or a class can, inherit, can implement an interface. So we've got in interface implementation is one thing, and inheritance is another. Yeah? Uh, so he's giving you the details of we don't inherit the private methods, but what if the public methods we inherit call those private methods? And it just doesn't cause a problem. They get called. And uh, I know you, you, you're bound to have lots of questions, uh, but again, my goal today is just to, to introduce these issues, then we'll come back next week and succeeding weeks and look at it. So when Jacqueline asked her a question, I, I thought she was, she was on something, because don't you say that back was this? B is a subtype of A, but you say A extends B. No, A is a subclass of B. So it's a subclass of B. Yeah, so um, that's <laughs> I see where that's coming from. That's what I was trying to learn. I wasn't reading my own slide here. <laughs> Oops. Oops. Gosh, no wonder everyone's saying that.
Yeah, in retrospect, yeah, it would have been. <laughs> I don't know if I realized when I started that it was wrong everywhere. Okay, sorry about that. So A is extending B. So A does the inheriting. It gets all the stuff in. And uh, then A would modify, could modify what inherited. Yeah? So when we like, override the method, we can now change the plan type. Right. You, when, you, when you inherit a method and then override it, you can't change its name, you can't change what parameters it takes. It's just the implementation for this. Okay. Now we got this settled. Okay. Let's see what this has to do with graphical user interfaces. Now that'll be the subject of the lab tomorrow. I, what I want to do is try to get to the point where the lab will make some sense. So let's go look at tipcalculator.java. So the idea is we're going to create a tip calculator application. So I'm going to do the world's simplest graphical user interface. So uh, here's the main method. And it's, this is going to look very weird. I'm just going to ask you to think of it as magic for the moment. Uh, this, is, this is the code that's technically required to launch a graphical user interface. You have to use this invoke method and this string syntax right here. But basically what's happening is this constructor is being called. And then the main method returns. And so the magic occurs, the main method returns, that usually means the program ends. But uh, this invoke later causes some code to be run on a separate thread, a separate thread of control. So something else other than the, the main thread. Uh, I'm using a word I haven't defined to realize. Um, Bottom line is the program won't end until tip calculator is uh, closed. So for right now, don't worry too much about that. Let's see what, the, what we do in the tip calculator method, or in the constructor for tip calculator. We create a JFrame object, and then we make it visible. So I'm going to run the program, and up pops our GUI interface. It's a, it's a window. We can do things like resize it. We can make it the full screen, we can make it smaller again, and we can X out of it. Okay? Unfortunately, that doesn't end the program when we do that. We got the manual to come in the program. Okay? So far, so good. Now, let's see what else we can do. JFrame, then, is the type of object that is the top, a top-level window. What do you suppose would happen if we called, if we did this twice? What if we created and invoked two different tip calculators? It would create two of them, yeah. And they work independently. So that's just what a, uh, that's what a J-frame is. So we've got to put something in the J-frame. All right, J-frame has methods, so kill. let me... Uh, kill it. Got to kill it. You know, I forgot to kill it. Um, the mouse is really acting up. So let's take out this thing here. We can set its preferred size. We can say, okay, I want it to be 300 by 400 pixels. I want the title at the top to be tip calculator. And what this says is, when I close the window, I want the program to end along with it. And then down here, it turns out, to make this work right, to actually make it 300 by 400, I've got to call this pack method. So I'm going to comment that, and I'm going to do this. So let's see what's left. We create the JFrame. We set the preferred size. We set the title. We say what to happen when it closes. And then we pack, which basically lays it out to the right dimensions, and we make it visible. Let's run it and see what happens. Okay. So we get a window that's 300 by 400 pixels. Uh, and furthermore, notice, see the red thing that says a program is running. When I X out of it, the actual the program stops running too. Okay. So pretty simple. It's just, just create an object, a J frame in this case, 
Call some methods to configure it the way you want, and you got a GUI. Now, it's not very useful yet, but it comes up. Yeah? Um, so what if you um, didn't set it visible? Would the window not show up? or what, what would Yeah, if, if we didn't set it visible, the window wouldn't show up. Okay. So, yeah, that's an important step. All right. Okay. Well, let's see what else we can do with this. Yeah? Why is that even a okay? Why is what? Setting it visible or not visible. Why would you want to make it invisible? Um, you know, in this case, you wouldn't because it's just a single window. But you might have multiple windows in your GUI and clicking somewhere makes some other window go away. That's, you do that by making it be invisible. Okay. Like a, a dialogue window, for example, that pops up. Okay. That'd be a J-frame. Okay, now, here we get into some polymorphism. I'm gonna just delete all the comment now. So there's something called a J-panel. So a J-panel is a component on which other components can be placed. So what I mean by that, if I go to J-panel here, and I, uh, well, that's not working for me. Let me try something else. Usually there's a place I can click and go to documentation. What am I doing wrong here? Okay, I'm going to have to just go to the documentation manually. Okay, here's JPanel. And I want you to look up there, uh, right here. So what this says is a J panel extends the component class. The component class extends the container class. The container class contain, extends the component. So we go J panel, J component, container, component, object. That's what's called an inheritance hierarchy. So whoever defined the J panel class said jpanel extends jcomponent. In the implementation of jcomponent, it says jcomponent extends container, and so on. So when I say a jpanel is a kind of component, that's what I mean. It extends component. So there's inheritance in action. Now, it's a component into which other components can be placed. So here's an add method, and I'll just read it for you. It says public component add component. Add takes a component as a parameter. So what we can pass to the add are other components. For example, we're adding a J label to the panel. We're adding a text field, a J text field to the panel. We're adding a new J label. We're adding a new J text field. What does that tell you about J label, J text field, and J button? The fact that we're able to pass them as parameters to this add method. What do you, what do you know about them? Yeah. Extend component. They all extend the component class. They're all components because they extend the component class. They're kinds of components. This is polymorphism in action. We don't have to define an add method for every possible kind of thing we want to add to a panel. We just make the panel so you can add components to it. If you want to create something that can be displayed on a panel, you just make sure it extends J component or component. Either extends it directly or extends something that it already extends it. So what's happening in all this code right here? Actually, this code right here. Yeah? You're adding uh, different like, buttons that right. you can use. Think about what I need in my, uh, in my tip calculator. I want, I want it to say, I want to label, I want to have a text box labeled with check amount. So I put a label on that says that. Then I throw in a text field where someone's going to type how much dinner costs. Then I have a label that says tip percentage. Then I want a text field that where you enter 15% or 20% or whatever. Then I want a button you calculate, you, you press to calculate the tip. I want a label that says total. Then I want to create a text field where the total is displayed. And I want to make that, that so that you, uh, it's, you can't type directly into it. So I just add all those things to the root panel. Then 
I take the root panel, there's a method in the JFrame called set content pane. I pass it the root panel, and that's displayed in the frame. Yeah? What is the, um, the 20 in the JTAG field parameter? Is that how long the, the characters that you put in? Yeah, the 20 has to do with the length of the field. Okay? So when I run this, what are we going to see now? How will it be different from the way it was before? Okay, so look what we got. We got our label in there. We added these things to this panel. The panel's being displayed in the window, and it's just all laid out. Check them out. Here's the place where you type the check them out. Here's the label tip percentage. Here's where you type the tip percentage. Here's the button to click on. Here's the total. Here's where the total is displayed. So what do you notice about this? Doesn't yeah? Look, doesn't look good. Uh, it doesn't look very good. I mean, why is this label up here on a line by itself? And if you, if you make it longer, it, does, you know, it still looks that way. If you make it wider, it, you know, I guess that's, that's not exactly what you'd expect, but that sort of makes a little more sense. So here's the deal when you're making a GUI. There are three phases. First of all, you figure what controls and labels and stuff you need. You put them in there. Next, there are two things you can do. One thing is, you can make it work. In other words, make it so that when someone clicks that button that some calculations get performed and the answer is displayed. You do that one way. The other thing is what? Yeah, the formatting. Actually making it lay out like you'd expect. Now, that, making it look nice, uh, is uh, you have to use what's called a layout manager to do that. And we'll be discussing layout managers in lab tomorrow. Getting the button to work, that's a, that's a different issue. And it involves uh, implementing an interface. Uh, involves interfaces. So that's, that's the subject we'll tackle next time. For now, let's just review where did polymorphism come in here? Remember, I introduced polymorphism. How did it show up? All right, it shows up because a J panel has an add method to which you can add components. And all these things, even though they're different types, J label, J text field, J label, J text field, J button, and so on, there are different types of things. They're all kinds of components because of inheritance. And if we were to go back to the documentation and we look for... Uh, let's say J button, what we're going to find when we go to the J button documentation is look, a J button, J button class extends abstract button, which extends J component, which extends container, which extends component. So a J button is a kind of component and can be added to a J panel. And the really cool thing about this is J panel was written a long time ago. I can create a class today that can be added to a J panel. Even though it wasn't even conceived of when J panel was created, the reason that works is because of inheritance. As long as my new class extends component, it's going to work. Okay? So we'll explore this more next time. <coughs>